unfold and reveal the focus that, uh, that God has laid on my heart for us to be looking at. Uh, we started and I shared last week with the state of the church talking about how this year's focus is going to begin with the, the thought in mind. The focal point will be a firm foundation, a firm foundation, and, and it's going to encompass a lot of areas. It's not just one and done, but, and you're going to understand as we move our way through today, but just the importance that we have something to stand firmly upon in our walk with the Lord that we can trust, we can hope, we can be secure no matter what's going on around us. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, and we're going to be looking at a particular particular focus today, but it reminds me, as I was preparing for this message today, it reminds me back in 2002. Uh, I had just moved back, my family and I had just moved back from New York. I'm a native Arizonan. I was born in Tucson and raised in Mesa, and I ended up for about five years going to work in a church in Long Island, New York. And so I was a blast, good time. You know, I didn't know that God was going to bring me back, but he did. We ended up coming back 2002. And in that, uh, when we moved back, now I have three small children and my wife, so there's five of us. And if you know apartments, apartments don't fit families of five very well. And so we ended up saying, okay, well, let's find a house, build a house. Well, it was kind of cool because we had the privilege. It actually made more sense and it was better and more affordable. And we actually built a home. Got to go to a new development and uh, there was just nothing but dirt, and dirt and more dirt. And so we got to pick the lot, and uh, then we got to plan and pick the, pick the house and all of this, which we did. We ended up uh, building a two-story, 2,400-square-foot home uh, on a corner lot. It was a lot of fun, but literally it was just an amazing thing to see a complete dirt lot go from dirt to house. And, and this time when they were building, they were animals. I mean, my house was built completely in three and a half months. And so they just, I mean, they just put that thing up now. And so what we used to do was fun as a family, my little ones, we would go out uh, every few days, and especially as things started to break on the ground, and it amazed us just to see the progress, uh, you know, lay out uh, in front of us. Um, we saw the foundation and the framing for that to be put up, and, and where the w walls would be, the doorways would be, that was kind of a cool experience to see, with each board and rebar, of course, protruding up, and you know, uh, just setting kind of that footprint of what it would be. Uh, I saw them then place, at least in, in Phoenix, the way they were doing it, is uh, these heavy braided steel kind of cords that would go across because there's something in, that they did there called post-tension. So they're laying this thing out, look like a perfect waffle. It was kind of cool just seeing it, you know, as it, it was all laid out together. And then finally, the day came for the concrete to come. And so they did, and uh, there was a morning that they took to pour, and, and we were able to be there for it, and it was kind of cool to see it. Um, <laughs> three cement trucks, man, it took to fill this thing, and uh, it was just the coolest thing ever to see them back up and pour all the contents, and then uh, it was just tons of concrete, and it would fill these little labyrinth channels, and, and just the way that they laid it all out, and, and uh, again, with each one, each truck, the, thick, it just, the thickness grew, and uh, of course, finally completed by that third truck over six inches deep, and it just was cool to see this flat space that one day would be our home, or our home would be standing there, which I thought was awesome. In fact, the next couple of weeks, that's when we saw the framers come, and, and they started erecting walls uh, for the downstairs first, and then put the ceiling on, and then went up that second flight, and, and it was just cool to watch, and, and grateful to be able to, to see that. All the methodical ways that they do in terms of how they build, I, I'm, I'm not that guy. I'm not, I'm not a mechanical guy. I'm a technical guy, so I, I get that. You want to talk computers all day long, I talk that with you. But mechanical, not so much, and it just was fun, and I appreciate those who have that gifting. But uh, just neat to see all that structure come to be. And, and then within three months, three months of stirring that ground up, here is this, this key handed to me, and my home is done, and we get to walk in. And I don't know if you've ever had the privilege of that, but man, I call it new car smell. You know what I'm talking about? Like we walk in, the carpet's new, the paint's new, everything just has that cool, crisp smell. And that was the, just a neat thing. And, and, and I will say this, especially watching the process and how they did it. And the moment we walked in, my wife and I and my children, we, we were never in fear that the house was going to collapse. We never were in fear that somehow, some way, this thing was going to fall over. Because we knew that it was, we saw with our 
physical eyes the fact that it was built on a very, very secure and strong foundation. And so I never even thought about that for a second, especially with this home. Um, that kind of got me thinking in terms of where we're at today, because so it is for us here now, presently, the, the importance of, of that firm foundation. Why? Because we live in an unstable and very insecure and very chaotic world, and it is swirling around us constantly, and I'll dare to say, dominated by satanic infiltration, which we know the end is coming. We know that Jesus' imminent return is coming. And so the enemy is going to start kicking up dirt and start making a mess and giving, giving us stress and all kinds of agita. That's a nice New York word for you. Agita. Irritation, definitely. But we see this in so many ways, which we know it's all part of the plan. It is. Every Christ follower. Hear, hear me. This is very important. Every single one of us who follow Jesus Christ, we must stand firm regardless, regardless of the chaos, regardless of the persecution, regardless of the tribulation that is swirling around. And I look at it like circling buzzards above waiting to feast upon us. No matter what it's doing, we cannot and must not, and shall not, let go of standing firm upon the Lord Jesus. We have to. It's imperative. And I will say as global demonic domination is sought, it is. The enemy is alive and well, okay? And, and it's, he's seeking to subjugate humanity and to bring about ushering in that very great tribulation, the event that's coming that is going to be incredible, because we know the backside of it is that Jesus returns, and we look forward to that. But as that continues to grow, as we see it moving in that direction, exponentially in agenda and in narrative and forced upon, and we see this today, a forced upon philosophical view that is just jammed down our throat in so many ways in this world, that, by the way, that view is ungodly, it's unbiblical, it's unrighteous, and it is unholy. And that is, even amidst that, each and every Christ follower is going to be tested. You and I are going to be tested. And there's only going to be two outcomes of that testing. Either one, we're going to be reactive, or two, we're going to resolve. And, and, and in that meaning, respond. That there's going to be a response. It's either going to be a reaction or it's going to be a response. Now, to react, we do not want to. We don't want the pressure to cave in. We don't want the pressure to compromise and abandon truth so as to accept the agenda and the narrative that's being jammed down our throats. But instead, we want to have a response. A response that is to stand firm on the truth of God's word to stand firm on Jesus Christ, to testify of his gospel, to continue to promote the light of Jesus, the truth that he is here for us and for the world to provide hope, and that we would do so without compromise, without surrender, and by no means being defeated. So we need to stand strong. So it is this firm foundation that is so vitally important. And it's that we shall gaze upon and behold and learn and grow. And so as we start talking about some of these aspects to what it means to have a firm foundation, we're going to start investigating and gazing into and, and, and holding on to and putting them all together so that we might be able to stand firmly on our feet and not give ground to the enemy, no matter how much dust and dirt he kicks up and hissy fitty he, 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 he throws in any fashion of that. We want to make sure in these key areas. We belong to Christ and that we want to become resolute and to never abandon Jesus or his word or hope or trust or sound doctrine or worship or prayer or obedience or being the family of God or the Holy Spirit and all of these just to name a few. By no means is this exhaustive, but these are some key things we're going to look at. So today, today our gaze is going to take one focus. And it's the focus specific today is going to be on worship. Worship being our firm foundation. 
So let me ask you this, okay? So I'm just gonna, we're going to free think here for just a moment. When I say that word worship, what comes to mind? Like, like what is it that in your mind just kind of pops when you hear that word, the context of it, the, the familiarity with it? I just want you to be thinking about it. Just think about that for just a moment. When you hear the word worship, what does that term mean? Maybe some of you right now are thinking, well, maybe thinking hymns and contemporary songs. Maybe, that's, maybe it's more style when you hear the word worship. Maybe when you hear worship, maybe you think of collectiveness or like, like in a church or in a concert or outside by a fire pit with a guitar. I don't know, something in that regard. Maybe some of you think of singing solo. Maybe some of you think in singing together. Maybe the word worship evokes the idea of a lifestyle. Maybe it is about praising God with song or with poem or with prayer. I don't know. This is a word that we use. It's a word that we say. And as we know, that in, when it comes to communication, it always boils down to semantics. How do we use and define the words that we use and so that we might communicate to one another? So it's how we use these words and what we mean by them that really helps us to kind of crystallize that idea. So what is it for you? See, worship shares all those things that I was telling you about. It's comprised of all of those statements made. But yet there's also a far broader understanding than each of these statements on their own. So let's, let's begin, first of all, with definition. Okay, uh, great resource. I, I just say this to you for your own personal edification and growth and equipping. Um, uh, gotquestions.org. Great place to go to. If you ever want to ask a cool question and find some information rather quickly, they've done a lot of subjects there. So they define, they define at gotquestions.org worship in this way. Now, it's using and looking at it from the context of the Bible. Okay, It says worship describes both a way of life and a specific activity. It's praising, adoring, and expressing reverence for God, both public and private, and our specific acts of worship. Now, a broader sense of it, it continues, says worship refers to overall lifestyle of serving and glorifying God and reflecting His glory to others. Worship. Merriam-Webster. Webster defines it as this. Reverence offered a divine being or supernatural power and an act of expressing such reverence. Okay, so if we take those two, kind of glean out the gems of it, some of the key thoughts concerning worship would be this, characteristically, that it's a way of life, that it's a posture. It's, it's, it's us in life and how we would posture ourselves in this, that we would say that it's a way of life of who we are. Praising, again, a key term in this, in this thought, is about the proclamation, about being vocal and having it, uh, you know, leave our lips. Uh, adoring would be a, the idea of positional in the sense of, of, of us in, in understanding the connection that we have with Jesus and, and just the gratefulness that we have. It's that adoring and appreciation on, on the deepest level. It could be expressing reverence. Again, showing the highest form of respect. I don't think it takes much. I don't think it's much of a stretch. If we would look at ourselves through the lens of humility and realize who we are in our humanity as compared to the holiness and the grandeur and the majesty of our almighty king. We can see there's a disparity there, <laughs> right? I hope you can see there's a disparity there between how incredibly amazing he is and how, though flawed as we might be, that God still loves us and has us in the coolest relationship ever. So when we offer reverence, yeah, we see Him in that way. And it is an offering. We give that to Him. It's, we should. We must. It should be a very natural thing, which we're going to talk more about here. So what does God's Word have to say? Well, turn with me in your Bibles. Psalm chapter 95. We're going to be in verses 1 through 7. Today... We're only focusing on the first two verses of Psalm 95. Okay. 
As you're turning there, I'm going to pray for us that God would just dial us in today. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the privilege and the honor of being here as your people. And God, I thank you for this body and what you're doing in us and through us and among us. And so, Father, we invite you into this moment asking that you would open our eyes, help us to see and understand, Father, what worship is and how foundational it is in our relationship with you. Give us ears to hear, Father, that your word might penetrate our heart and Father, we want to yield fully to the Holy Spirit as you did in that upper room, as you pierced those who were there and present. God, we ask that you would do the same in us, that you would draw us to yourself, that you would illumine this word that we might understand, and that, Father, from it that we might grow in our relationship in, with you, that we might mature, be complete, lacking nothing. So, God, we just trust you for this moment. Give us insight, we pray. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. What I'm going to do is this. I'm going to read all of verses 1 through 7, which, by the way, little note, I want you to meditate on that, pray about it, read it several times between now and next week, because we're going to finish the last part of this, of this psalm next week. But verses 1 and 2, we're going we're gonna to dial in on today. But from that, I'm going to read it all, and then we're going to come back and talk about it, Okay. So I'm reading to you at a New American Standard, Psalm 95, verse 1. O oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods in whose hand are the depths of the earth. The peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for it was he who made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you would hear his voice. Let's break this down here and kind of work our way through it. The background of this psalm, of Psalm 95, I, I have a, a study Bible by MacArthur. It's got some notes in it. I, I kind of like what he said. I want to share that with you, just kind of giving us some history of this as we're parachuting into this. Uh, psalm 95. This psalm, in fact, it has references in here to the wilderness wanderings, and we kind of catch that more towards the end of Psalm 95. It may have been the possibility composed by David, and really it was centering in on for the Feast of Booths or Tabernacles, and it was during this feast that the people of Israel, they lived in booths remembering God's provisions for them in the wilderness. So there's kind of a, a flavor of that here within Psalm 95. So just an observation. When God provides, and I'm saying when you know in your life something happens, something's provided, that there's no doubt that it wasn't you or man or someone else, but it was indeed God who showed up, did something cool, it could be small, it could be big, it could be anything in between. When that happens, when that is provided, when God provides in this way, an attitude of gratitude should and must surface in our response to him. Do you believe, do you believe that today? That when he moves, when he provides when he speaks into and or blesses in some fashion, that it should evoke immediately at the deepest part of who we are a response that is an attitude of gratitude of God, you are so good. And that it should just well up within us in a huge way. And, and all of that demands a thank you, really. And it's not God up there saying, I just want to get thanked. 
but it's that when, when we see and experience that blessing in that way, that it's just, we can't help but say, God, God, thank you. Thank you. That's what needs to be within each of us as he provides and as he blesses. What we must be weary of, whether we are young or whether we're old, we must be weary that when, when it is clear that God has blessed us or provided in some way, that we don't ever get to the place where we say in our heart that, man, I did a great job, or man, I made that happen, or man, I provided for this, or I provided for that. We never want to come to that position. We never want to allow ourselves to take that attitude. Why? Let me ask you. Have you ever had a bout with arrogance or pride? <laughs> Has that gone well? Let me ask you. Has it gone well? No, 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 no. Arrogance and pride, they are not your friend. In fact, there is always a much steeper and higher cost that is far greater than anything that's ever accomplished or received. We don't ever want to put ourselves and put the I word before anything that God clearly gives as a blessing. We don't want that, ever. In fact, it's God's provision, it's God's power that is the source, the real source, really, of anything that you have or have been provided with. Everything. Guys, think about that. Your very life, the very breath that you breathe, the homes that you have, the food that you possess, the jobs, the family, the friends, the church family, other believers, your material possessions, everything, everything has come from him. And how we have to maintain that position in the attitude and gratitude that we have. See, the psalmist here, interesting, calls us, begins a, a very corporate call. He's, he's drawing us into a declaration, a proclamation. Notice what he says here. He says, oh, come, verse 1, oh, come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. See, there's a reason why he does this. See, when the people of God... When we gather together and when we express our inward love and gratitude and thankfulness, and we do so in an outward manner and sing for joy to the Lord, and in that we're directing our love, we're directing our gratitude, our thankfulness, and we're doing so in a vertical way that is being experienced horizontally, but we're, but we're doing and directing vertically, what happens is that God is praised, God is honored, and God is glorified by everything that we proclaim. Guys, is there not much to be joyful and thankful for what the Lord has done? Is there not much that we could say, that we could speak? In fact, I'm going to shake it up. We're going to do something here. You ready? We're going to do this. It was amazing that the first service was cool. Second service, I anticipate it being just as cool. I want us to do something just here right now. In thinking along the understanding of much to praise and sing unto the Lord with joy, I want a response from you today to literally say out loud. I want you to say it out loud in regards to this from your seat. What has God done? What has he provided that with joy you can cry and you can sing out to him. So what is it in you? Just a couple words, few words, small sentence. What can you sing out to joy for the Lord? Who wants to be brave and go first? Say it. Life. Held me together amidst everything. Joy in itself. What else? Say it again. Your kids. Salvation. Forgiveness, reconciliation. Yes, absolutely. And amen, we got a better one coming. Yes. For your wife, your helpmate. 
Praise the Lord. Yes. Your friends, friendships, connections that God gives. What else can you sing for joy to the Lord in what he's done for you? Healing. Say it again. Healing. Healings. Wall of fire. Our teachers. Our teachers. Oh. <laughs> Praise God, brother. I did not pay you, I promise. I did not pay you. Thank you, bro. What were you going to say? peace that's there, no matter what we go through. Yes, in the back. Praise God for the Holy Spirit. Our church family. His Word. Do you, do you see, isn't this exciting? Because there's so much, so much that we can sing for joy unto the Lord. Ways in which He just blesses us and provides for us in so many ways. Man, it's awesome. You guys did great. That's awesome. So many wonderful things that we can. See, the danger, the danger comes when we don't see these things. The danger comes when we kind of, maybe just kind of, maybe it appears like walking out or kind of take it for granted, but maybe, I, I don't know about you, I'll be honest, I, there's been times, I'm sure, I'm sure of it, that God has done things, provided things, and man, I was oblivious to it. I got too distracted by this, too distracted by that. I got too whiny or cra crazy about this. You know what I'm saying? I'm sure I have. See, but the danger is we don't want to, we don't want to, we don't want to miss that. We don't want to miss what God does. We want to be tuned into him so we see these things so that we can give thanks back to him. Especially in the ways that he has worked or blessed or provided because of Again, spiritual blindness or worldly distractions or even the scheduled busyness. I know sometimes in my busyness, that's when I oversee things or overlook things. Sometimes we either simply ignore it or overlook it. I will say this. This probably, probably is a word of caution for all of us is that we, we as a Christ follower, we must, we must slow down, guys. We just got to slow down some. Got to slow down and, and observe clearly and ask God, multi really seriously, ask God. God, give me the eyes to see. Help me not to miss it. Help me not to see your hand. Help me not to see, you know, to, to not, you know, to miss your working. Help me not to miss or, or not be able to see where you're at work. All these things. There's many that he's done. See, David, we believe he wrote this psalm here to direct our attention from the beginning with God, God himself being the object of our praise, that he's the one that receives it of our joy and our thanksgiving and that by our voices and shouting or crying out to him directly. If you want to write something down to ponder throughout the week, I'll give this to you. Ready? Write this down. Praise is given before any petition. Praise is given before any petition. Now, what do I mean by that? It means that we can't treat God like Santa Claus. Oh, we can sit on his lap and say, oh, yeah, that's what I want, that's what I want, that's what I want, what I want, what I want, 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 want. Don't start there. Would you be annoyed as a father if your child did that out of the gate? Yeah, I'd say, really? Seriously? Think about this. Praise is given before any petition, meaning we need to start with God. You, you are good. You have blessed. God, I thank you. I joyfully give you praise and adoration for all that you are, all that you've done. The fact that we have salvation in you, that we can even come to you and even talk to you. That needs to be present first and foremost before any request Another way to say petition. Any request is made. And the reason is our approach must first be a focused heart. It must be that heart upon God, upon the Lord Jesus that we have now in the New Testament. And the psalmist here, what he's doing is calibrating us, calibrating the thinking and the reader out of the gate through really to call to praise and worship God appropriately with reverence and adoration and thankfulness so that we don't take it lightly. We don't take it lightly. Notice the call and notice the expected response here. Verse 1 says, O come. The psalmist starts with, O come. That, that's, a, that's an invitation of corporate togetherness. And, and he says, let us 
Again, that corporate mindset. The ex expectation as a body that, that we're to sing for joy to the Lord and we're to shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. The expectation that we have that ability together and our singing for joy and our shouting joyfully is directed to the King of Kings himself, to his direct throne. See, the psalmist is saying that with our voices that, and, and our instruments and the things that we use, that, that we cry out this cry of gladness and thankfulness and, and most importantly with humility. See, it's that joy that we have in Christ. That's what should be welling up and bubbling inside. I mean, just waiting to get out. Right? There's so many things that if we stop, and we did share many of them, that we would say, God, I am so thankful for all that you've done. It should just be right off of the tip of our tongue. It should roll off our lips. It shouldn't be sitting going, mm, what can I be thankful for? <laughs> right? We need to have that present right in, in the moment. And it must burst forth from our hearts with the vessel of our mouth and our voice. See, if we translate this, this is what in essence we're saying, that the roof of this place, when we gather, when we come together as God's people, the roof of this place should lift off as we join together with our voices and with our hearts, singing for joy and shouting joyfully, directing everything to Him. I'm going to say this, and this is just me and my thinking. I don't know if it was a dream. I don't know what it was, but I will say to you that I believe with all my heart there is something spiritual that happens in the unseen realm that we cannot partake in in terms of seeing that happens when God's people come together and lift up praises and adoration and joy that if he would peel back the separation between the, the physical and the spiritual realm, I don't know, maybe it's just what we know Scripture says, that God inhabits the praises of his people. That means that's living life. I mean, that's, that's real deal stuff. It's not, it's not words on a page that we're just mouthing. But when our spirits come together, Right? The Spirit of God in you, the Spirit of God in me, the Spirit of God in us, and we start singing and proclaiming and praising. See, I think there's something, something happens in that spiritual realm that it is a direct, a direct feed. I don't know if it's light, I don't know what it is, but something from this earth, from this gathering that shoots straight to the throne of God. You talk about beautiful. I mean, we'll probably get it when we're on that side of heaven. We'll understand really what worship is. Right? But that's the privilege we have here now. God gives us the ability for this. But this place, corporately, when we worship, sing, and shout for joy to God Almighty with instruments and voice, it shouldn't be somber. It shouldn't be solemn in terms of display, but it should be celebrative and declarative, and, and that God himself is in full view of every, every bit of what we're doing. The goodness of God. I love that song that we ended on here. The goodness of God. There's some songs, isn't it cool, some songs you'll hear or sing or say, and man, it just like hits you right in the heart, right? It's amazing. Moves you in a cool moment. I'm going to say something, okay? It's going to be a disclaimer. I've got to give you my little disclaimer here. I am not thinking of anybody in particular. Okay, you're like, whoa, okay, this is going, this is getting dark. Here we go. <laughs> Here's the thing. No, I'm not thinking of anybody individually, okay? That's not what I'm thinking of. I'm not judging anybody, and I'm not up here shaming anybody. Okay, so I don't want anybody to feel self-conscious in this, like, well, he, I know he's thinking about me. I'm not, I'm not. <laughs> I promise, I'm not. I'm just talking observationally what I've seen over the years among God's people, among the church universal. Here, elsewhere, everywhere, okay? So it's very broad stroke, so I'm not being nitpicky specific. And it's really more of an observation. And, and when I'll say this, 
in light of the things that we're saying and, and how it shouldn't be somber or solemn, but, but celebrative, de, you, know, de, you know, declarative in the way that we, we come about and give every bit of our being together and individually. I'm saying from an observation view, it saddens my heart sometimes for the individual. When I see that as we gather as God's people, we gather as Christ's followers and, and those who, who've claimed to be, which I'm not doubting that they aren't, and we're gathered as God's family corporately and songs of praise and joy and thanksgiving are being made and being sung. And then, and then, then, the, then the observation is there's an individual that stands in his closed mouth and, and, and is not joining in with what everyone else is proclaiming and praising and singing. It seems disinterested, but I, I don't know because, again, I'm not judging it could be they heard a song and it hit them in the heart and they're speechless and they have nothing to say. Those moments have happened to me. So I don't know. But it gives the appearance of just disinterest. And I've seen that from time to time over the body of Christ in corporate gatherings. And it saddens me. It saddens me especially in the heart because Inside of me, I wonder, I wonder with sadness, is, is there no gratitude? <clears throat> is there no joy within which to proclaim or to celebrate uh, that would move or stir a response? Like, like, again, if it's on the tip of your tongue, that, that why, why doesn't it come out? And, and I'm, I don't know. Because together we're lifting song and praise and voice and joy and thankfulness and all that, directing it to our King of Kings and and giving him the attention, and we, we can never thank him enough, can we? I mean, I don't think we're ever going to tire of saying, God, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Even that, I believe, I'm, that's wuss words, right? It's a wuss word. It doesn't really communicate the depth of it. It's, it's just light. When you say thank you, it's just light compared to the gratitude. But that's the best word we have in order to say that. See, there's so much we can thank him for. All that he's done. And especially when we look at how much we are incapable of doing for ourselves and what he's done. See, God, God is, in verse 1, he is the rock of our salvation. He's the one we rest upon. He's the one that we hold on to. He's the one that provides life. In fact, this wilderness experience was <laughs> the children of Israel tested God and he brought water from a rock. Literally. The rock of salvation, dry, no par uh, parched and, and uh, no water in the desert. It's kind of important. I mean, you need water. That rock of our salvation. And he's the focus of all that we proclaim. So, and, and, okay, with this, again, okay, I'm, I'm off that for a moment here. Be honest with me. Just, just in your heart. Don't want you to raise your hand. Don't want you to self-incriminate. That's not what I'm asking you to do. Okay? And again, I'm not thinking of anybody in particular. Anyone. But be honest. Are some of you, are some of you sensitive and some of you shy or hesitant or self-conscious about singing in front of others around you? Do some of you get that way? I've had conversations where people say, well, you haven't heard me sing. <laughs> right? <laughs> And sometimes they get a little hesitant. They do. Is that you? Do you feel that way? Is there some hesitation or sensitivity in this? I want you to be honest with yourself and before God, because God knows. God knows your heart. Let me ask you a question. If that's you, and you're hesitant or shy or somehow feel self-conscious about that singing in front of others, my question for you is this. Why do you care about the other people around you? Right? Why do you care? Why do we give so much emphasis to that? I mean, are you singing to your neighbor? Is it a serenade that you're doing? No. No, it's not. Are you singing to the Lord of lords and the King of kings and the rock of our salvation? Is that who you're singing to? See, if that's who you're singing to, perhaps your fear and your hesitation is holding you back. And, and here's a truthful statement. Without following you around, without hanging out with you in your car when it's just you, 
without standing, and I'm, I specify this, standing on the outside of the bathroom listening to you in the shower, <laughs> okay? I'm not following you around in that way. But ladies, come on, all of you are Beyonce when you're by yourself, aren't you? <laughs> right? And guys, you're all John Legend if you know who he is. Right? Don't lie. Come on. We let it rip when it's us by ourselves. Yeah? Do we care how we sound? No, we don't care how we sound. And there's some, and here's the thing. If, even if, you, if you're that one that when you sing, you enjoy all the notes that, at the same time, that's okay, too. <laughs> that is okay, too. Psalm 100, verse 1, reminds us and says that we need to make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Make a joyful noise. Make, it's a command of direction. Joyful, the attitude, noise. Well, okay, noise is noise is noise. To the Lord, because he's the object of it. Again, it's a vertical expression that, that, that is a, a horizontal experience. So when we sing and proclaim this way, I'll say earthside, it might be noise. It might be. You might sing off key. You might be out of rhythm. You might sing flat. You might sing sharp. You might sing soft or loud. You might even sing in perfect pitch, in perfect harmony, and with perfect volume. You might. But if you're singing to the Lord and you're singing to the rock of our salvation... Do you realize that all that what we would call as noise that is joyfully sung and shouted that comes from within the soul and within the heart of the Christ follower that is filled with joy and gratitude and humility and praise and adoration with thanksgiving, all of it being directed to him, not conscious, not caring to focus on mankind who's on my left or right, do you realize that that kind of singing, that kind of shouting for joy to the Lord, then the rock of our salvation, to God, to God, He receives that proclamation, hear me now, as perfect, as pure, as holy, and as praise. And you know what that becomes to Him? That becomes a beautiful, sweet sound to his ear. Think about that. I was humbled completely. I'm going to share this thought with you that, man, I was in, prepara in preparing this message. All of a sudden it struck me. The way that God receives it when it comes from us and it's real. See, to think to think that God's heart, hear me, that God's heart is blessed, blessed by any human's song that is sung to him. That we actually can bless God. That when he receives that praise, that it, it makes him smile. Dare I say, warm his heart. That's huge. That we have the ability in, in proclaiming to him. It's humbling. It's humbling to think that. That it can go full circle from a heart that, that loves him. He becomes blessed through the blessing. I mean, catch this. He, God is good and he's a good, good father. And, and, and we know the goodness of him. And so he blesses us the way he does and provides the way he does. And then in our hearts, we're, we're grateful and thankful, and the attitude of gratitude goes through the roof, and we're just like, God, there's so much to say thank you for, right? And then when we come together and we sing and we praise the blessing by which he gave returns to him, and he just smiles. That's beautiful. See, what we do, it's not small. And if God truly inhabits the praises of his people, it's very important that we recognize that and remember that. It's huge. It's like a full circle that returns to him. 
with love and joy and thankfulness. So Christ follower, do you understand my sadness? Do you understand when I see that, observe that, and see someone that's not engaging, that's not speaking out, that's not singing out, that just seems disinterested or whatever? Again, not judging, not shaming, but could be they're in deep thought. I don't know. But my sadness in observing those who stand silent with no expression or connection or celebration of proclamation alongside the family of God and whom he belonged together, it just makes me sad because I'm thinking, man, you're missing out. You're missing out on an opportunity. And we in Christ are privileged to be able to sing or shout in this way, truly. It's, it's a privilege that God has granted. It gives us the, the ability to. I mean, I think of the honor that the seraphim have among the throne of God. They say, all time, holy, 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 is the Lord God Almighty. Is there, there is a perpetual song of worship around that throne for eternity. And that is their role, to guard the throne and to proclaim who sits on it. It's an amazing thing. Notice the psalmist here reveals our privilege and directs the attitude of our hearts and voice towards God. Look at what he says, verse 1. Oh, come, come. Let us sing for joy the attitude to the Lord, the object of our, of our praise. Let us shout joyfully again the attitude to the rock of our salvation, Him being the object of our praise. Verse 2, let us come again, come before His presence. He's the object of our, of our praise with thanksgiving. That is our attitude. Let us again corporately together Shout joyfully, that's our attitude, to him, the object, with psalms, which are his very word spoken back to him. See, there's a key to not overlook. And this is it as we round the corner here to finish this up this morning. Praise is a privilege. We don't ever want to forget that. It's a privilege. One that we want to treat carefully and valuably. That we are all invited into together so that with as children focused on the Father, that our voice might come together and, and that in this, that it might reach his ears and it might do so in unison and in that be filled with joy and thanksgiving and in praising him. Giving him every bit of who we are. Worship, again, is a gift. It's a privilege that God has provided every Christ follower and every corporate body together. Right? The invitation's given without ceasing for our hearts to join together and to focus on God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this invitation is our reminder to sing. It's our reminder to shout and shout joyfully, directed to Him, not man, not woman, and not the person on either side of you, that we give it to Him and Him alone. It's interesting to me, all right? I'm going to say this little side, side jaunt for just a moment sparked something in thinking. You know, I said that we have a demonic agenda that the enemy of our soul is trying to subjugate humanity and force philosophy down our throat, the narrative, the agenda that we see, the chaos, the tribulation that's being stirred. Interesting to me. Go back to the year 2020. COVID-19 hit the, 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 the ground running shut the world down, shut our country down. Isn't it interesting to me to say, is there not a demonic agenda? Here, Lego, let me ask you something. What was considered a non-essential service that was to remain open? Come on. Church. Religious church, right? California, hello. No slam to Cali, but California was a great example, right, of that. And we saw that here in Arizona, not as much. Right, But worldwide, they said from the news that the churches are not a, a, a essential service. And what, what did they give? Come on. What did they give? And I'm not making political thing here. Or, or that. Just hear me what I'm saying. This bothered me so bad when it happened. What did they say as to the reason why churches were non-essential and a danger to the public? Why did they say that? Do you remember? Singing. Come on. Singing. Why? Because they gave us the load of garbage, and it's garbage, I'll say it on record, that what? 
Oh, that, uh, that molecules of wet moisture blah, 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 floats into the air and COVID-19 is going to kill everyone around you. Right? In essence is what they said. So hence we can't sing. Singing, no, 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 no. Full circle. Do you think there's a demonic agenda? <laughs> we just said God inhabits the praises of his people. Come on. Think about this. The enemy wants to stop the praise of God's people because there's power in it. I'm just saying, crazy. Think about that. In this moment, why it's so important not to give it up, that it is our privilege and that we're not worried about the man or woman next to us. Praise indeed is our privilege and worship is our foundation to stand firm upon. Hence, why we're beginning this. Guys, get to read the rest of the chapter. I'm, I'm the rest of these, that section of verses I gave you, read uh, verse 3 through 7 because we're going to go through that next week. And we're going to finish this thought up. But praise indeed is our privilege and something we have to stand firm upon. Elevating our focus, our attitude and gratitude for God, the way that he is in our lives and the blessings that he provides. It is he that is without question due fully our joyful expression of singing and shouting unto him. And the truth is, is that God has uniquely wired mankind to worship him. We're wired this way. That's why we get compelled when we come together. We hear the songs. We just, man, we just write all oh, in that moment because it's in us eternally, internally to be able to proclaim to him our entire being, mind, and soul, and voice with the admiration and the proclamation of our love and thankfulness to and for him, joyfully for the love that he has for us. So Christ follower, I just ask you to think about this. You here, you tuning in. Have you stepped into the invitation that God has given to you? Are you all in? Or are you allowing hesitation to pull you back? To come and sing and let us shout joyfully as we come before his presence. Are you, are you holding back or hesitant in some way? Where is joy in you? Have you expressed it? Have you made it known and released it to him without fear? Because truly there is so much to be joyful in that we must, each of us, we need to reflect within and, re and just release with our gratitude and release in our thankfulness. And we need to tell our Father who is so, so good. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the privilege to proclaim to you, to sing unto you. We get the joyful heart and God to shout to you the rock of our salvation. God, what a privilege we have. And Father, even humbled to think that our praises sound so perfect to you and are sweet to you and please you and warm your heart. God, <laughs> you're so good. Father, may we be a people of praise. May we, we live a life of worship. And may we point everyone to you. We are so grateful and thankful for all you're doing now, all you have done, and even thank you for what you're going to do. We love you. We thank you. We give you all the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week.